Coming up on American Black Journal, award-winning filmmaker Julie Dash has achieved a number of firsts as an African-American woman in the movie industry. We'll talk with Julie about her latest project, teaching Wayne State University students about her craft. Plus, the Detroit Tigers pay tribute to African-American baseball players. We'll talk with a Tigers executive and a Detroiter who played in the Negro Leagues. That's all coming up next. Lindsay wants to know. So I'm curious, what's DT Energy doing to improve their customer service? Why don't we take a ride over there and let Rachel tell us. Hello. Hello. Take a walk with me. Here at DT Energy, we're working very hard to improve our service, like answering every call under one minute and resolving the issue on the first call. Wow. No passing the buck, huh? Nope. And plus, we're adding over 100 customer service jobs right here in the state of Michigan. I need to get a real job. I'm going to send your application. Thanks, Rachel. DTE Energy. Know your own power. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. Julie Dash has made history as an African-American female movie maker. And now she's sharing her passion and vision with Wayne State University students by teaching a special filmmaking class. She's widely known for writing, directing, and producing Daughters of the Dust in 1991. It was the first full-length movie by an African-American woman to be widely released in theaters. Let's take a look. We're here today to show our respect to our family elders and to celebrate our family's cross to the mainland. But we are also here today to honor the old souls, many who from the very, very beginning of our creation guided our journey from one world to another. We're here today because our parent took we by the hand and teach we to swim the current surrounding these islands. And they teach we to... And recollect how we live in a time for freedom come in the old days. I'm pleased to welcome Julie Dash to American Black Journal. Welcome to American Black Journal and welcome to Detroit. Thank you. Uh, you've Steven. been here since uh, January, right? Yes, teaching I have. at Wayne. Tell me about the class that you were teaching. Well, the class is called um, From Script to Screen, mm -hmm. and it's an intensive uh, master class for directors, writers, production designers, as well as cinematographers. And I think there's one editor in the class as well. And um, so we just put our heads together and we work and we collaborate and we've made uh, like six films. Right, okay, so there they were actually making films oh, yeah. uh, in, yeah, this, yeah. in this class. Mm -hmm. And so what are you seeing with the, the young people at, at Wayne in terms of uh, their filmmaking uh, ability, the vision, the stories they want to tell, I would imagine well, that's, so, that's something, right? It's very exciting. Yeah. It's very exciting because their views are very different from, sure. you know, I'm a totally another generation. <laughs> right, and, uh, right. And, and they have a lot of interesting ideas and um, so it's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, uh, when you uh, talk to young filmmakers like that, like you said, they're a different generation, totally different set of experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you seeing from them that, that, that uh, that's so different? What, do you, what, what, uh, what separates them from, from, say, you? Well, I, I see their passion. And so it reminds me of when I was a, a film student because I have an undergraduate degree in film and then later I went to a film conservatory and then later I went to four years of uh, getting an MFA in film. And so that same passion is kind of um, yeah. rose to the surface and, and, it's, and that's exciting for me right. as, a, as a teacher. Right, right. And, uh, but of course they're doing everything in digital. And oh, absolutely. You are <laughs> you're used to film and yes. all these other things. Yeah, so they could do a lot that's more. A big, a lot that's a big difference, right? Oh my gosh. It, does that make it easier to be a filmmaker now or do you think it makes it harder to concentrate on the craft because the tools are so technologically sort of... Uh, There's a whole list of pros and a whole list of cons, yeah. but I'm glad that the digital age is here yeah. and they're able to use it yeah. because they certainly can make films for a whole lot uh, less money than what we, you know, uh, each one of our assignments would be something like $10,000. Right. So, yeah, when you were in school. Yeah, when I was in uh, graduate school. So really? Yeah. 
they yeah. can make it for uh, uh, a couple hundred. Right, now. right. And uh, maybe on a laptop computer, right? Um, uh, true. You can edit. Yes, you could edit at home. Yeah. We couldn't really right. edit at home because we had uh, huge equipment and it was film stock. And so there are a lot of differences. But then at the same time, so they could work faster, more efficiently. Uh, uh, but then um, there are a lot of like I fi I'm finding little black holes in their whole aesthetic sensibilities that are right? different. Yeah. And the um, the effect of watching a dig digitally mastered film is has a different is a different from a cinematic right. film production. So yeah, yeah. You know, to try to mesh the two is um, it's interesting. Right, <laughs> right. Well, uh, Daughters of the Dust, which is now 22 years old, yes, uh, you know, is is a beautifully shot uh, film. I mean, uh, that's one of the things that I remember being it struck by. It won Best Cinematography well, yeah, at the Sundance Film Festival that's right. in 1991. Um, yeah. Where does that aesthetic come from for, for, for you? Um, it's something that I work with my cinematographer and my production designer, and we came up with we were trying to create a black aesthetic, okay. an authentic black aesthetic in, in this particular production. Right, right. And that was something that back then, it's hard, I think it's hard for people now to remember, but that was, that was, uh, that was unheard of uh, yes. in 1991, that, just what you were talking about. Exactly, because uh, Carrie Jane Marshall, who's a fine artist who went on to win a MacArthur Genius um, of Fellowship. Grant, right, Grant. sure. Uh, he was our production designer, and Michael Kelly Williams, who is a Detroit local, uh -huh. was our art director. And both of them were like fine artists in their own right. right. And then, of course, Arthur Jaffer was an award-winning cinematographer. And then we just put our heads together and came up with a look that I think it, it has not been duplicated since. Yeah, yeah. but it did change the way people... Uh, see film in general, and it certainly opened the doors for a lot of other African American. I hope so. Film. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, we've seen a lot uh, since then, right? Mm -hmm. uh, talk about how different it is now than it was then. Uh, as I said in the open, you know, uh, that marked a lot of firsts for the industry in terms of uh, an African American woman uh, 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 shooting yeah, a film. Yeah, at the at, at the time, well, I had made several films prior to this film, but nothing that would had reached that was a wide, wide release. distribution. Yeah. You know, I was better known in other countries for my short films. Um, but yes, what, once this was distributed, and we didn't know at the time that it was um, the first one right. that was gonna get this, you know, like moniker on it as being the first reaching wide distribution sure. because of course there were other female filmmakers who had made feature films but they did not get distribution right. like this. Like right, right. And it seems like at that time you also had, I mean, you, you, you had uh, uh, yourself, Spike Lee was was starting to, to really sort of explode. You had John Singleton, yeah, who, Ernest, who made uh, Ernest Dickerson, uh, right? Juice Ernest Dickerson came out the same year, right? Mm -hmm. it, it seems like that was uh, an era where we had a lot of uh, African American made films about African American subjects. Am I wrong in saying that there aren't as many now? There Is are there as words? many now. There, there, there are, are okay. As many now, but for some strange reason, the press picked up on that and it became very trendy and the focus, the media focused on us like that. So now there are actually more. There are more. Yeah, but the media, you know, of course everyone knows about Ava DuVernay uh, and her right. success sure. at, with uh, uh, winning Best Directorial at Sundance. And then the year before that, it was Dee Rees with Pariah. Right. You know, who won. Um, so there are actually more African-American filmmakers around uh -huh. now and, and working and producing wonderful works. Right. But uh, the, uh, the press has moved a story on to anymore. other things. Right, right. Are, well, know, that's in a way, maybe that's a good thing, right? That it's not, it's not a novelty. It's, a, uh, it's actually you're right. Right. You're yeah, absolutely it's, right. It, you know, it should be, you know, it's a given. It's a given that, that you know, we make films too. You what, know. what do you see in films now uh, that, 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 that gives you sort of hope or inspiration in terms of uh, black film right? that, that maybe we didn't even have to. Well, what's so exciting for me is to see films uh, made just not by African Americans, but by everyone that just have to do with um, the human condition. Right, right. Just living your lives and how to make changes and adjustments and 
and, and not necessarily something about race or or discrimination or whatever because also in many ways that's a given too right but that's not something that's it does not define our lives right right every film with African Americans and it doesn't have to be about them it's being African American sure. exactly sure so uh, we were talking before about uh, you have an exciting project coming up that I want to oh. make sure we talk about oh yes tell that's me about uh, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's battalion it's a um, period piece uh -huh. that takes place during World War II, and it's about the African-American women who were wax, who served overseas during World War II. Right, which is, uh, you know, again, sort of an untold story, oh, right? Absolutely. I mean, people don't know about, uh, about yeah. this sort of thing. There were 855 um, African-American wax mm -hmm. and 2,000 African-American nurses. Right. Right. In the European theater of conflict. Yeah. And no one knows about it. And no them. one knows about it. I mean, we, we've seen in, in recent years uh, uh, stories come out about more stories being told, I suppose, about African American men and their role in, yeah. in, in, in the war. But the African American women have not had a lot of attention. And so. there's plenty of story there. So we're planning on doing an eight hour mini series yeah. so we could touch upon a little bit of all of what. Yeah, happened and, right. and their wonderful stories and achievements and fighting a war on two fronts. Right. Fighting for democracy at home and abroad. And now a film like that, uh, what would be your, your hope, hoped for target? Was this, would this be on Everyone. PBS? Would this be in theaters? Would this? Oh, I, it would be more, I want to go video on demand. Uh -huh. is, that the, is that the way uh, now to, 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 the, to get stuff to distributed? Uh, well, in that way, you don't have to ask someone to <laughs> That's right, <laughs> right. You can do it on your own, right? Exactly. Right. Uh, talk about how much easier or harder it, it, it is now for you as a filmmaker to get stuff made, to get stuff distributed, that kind of thing. Is that getting easier for African Americans? Is that getting easier for women? Uh, Actually, it would appear not. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's right. No, it's no, not any it's easier. it's not getting any easier, no. Uh, why, why is that? Well, um, for one thing, um, independent film has suddenly become a genre. Right. The studios are all doing independent films. Right. <laughs> so every, yeah. So uh, when, now we're in competition with ourselves to do an independent film. Uh, funding, of course, you know, very quickly has, you know, like dwindled. Yeah. Uh, art houses that focused on independent films uh, have been closing Are down. closing, sure. Yeah. So um, actually, it's a... It's pretty And, and there are more independent filmmakers, right. which is a good thing, right. but um, right. it's, it's very difficult to yeah. film. Right? So you've been in Detroit for about four months. About uh, four months yeah. tell, me, tell me one thing that, that shocked you about uh, Detroit, and tell me one thing you really love about it. I didn't know it snowed so much. <laughs> <laughs> it does snow here. It snows yeah. a lot. It snows like, well, this was a snowy winter for us. Not well, a lot of accumulation, but a lot of. Yeah, it didn't always place. stick, but it, every yeah. time you look up, there's like, yeah, there's what's something dropped, coming something out, like of sky, dropping right? out of the sky, right? Sure. The, what I love about Detroit is the, the remaining ex architecture. Yes. Right. It's beautiful, yeah. even though there are areas of like, you know, like zombie land, but <laughs> can yeah. I say but, that? And places, I mean, and at Wayne and uh, in the Cultural Center, you're around some of the really fine architecture that we have. Here. Yeah, I didn't know that, yeah. so. All right. Well, glad to have had you here, and good luck Thank with you. your film. Thank you very much. Just ahead on American Black Journal, the Detroit Tigers celebrate the legacy of African Americans in Major League Baseball. A former Negro League player from Detroit provides us with a living history lesson. That's coming up next. All of this weekend, the Detroit Tigers are celebrating the contributions of Negro League players to the game of baseball. The team's 11th annual tribute comes as the nation celebrates the 66th anniversary of Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier on Major League Baseball as a Brooklyn Dodger. Joining me now to talk about Robinson's legacy and the Tigers' tribute are Ronald Teasley, who's a former Negro League player and native Detroiter, and Ellen Zerang, who is the Vice President of Marketing for the Detroit Tigers. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thanks for having me. Very glad to have you here. 
here. I, I don't know if you guys watch this, but I am a huge baseball fan. So it is Good. really an honor to have uh, to have you here in in in, in particular. Uh, thanks for having us. Tell me a little about the about your career. Well, my career started right here in Detroit. Uh -huh. I uh, attended uh, Northwestern High School uh, and Wayne State University. I played at both. Uh, places uh -huh. and uh, had some good years of, uh, of play at both places. I batted 400 at Northwestern, I batted 500 at Wayne State and it's, it's still a school record. Yeah, I was going to say those have got to be records, right? right? Yeah. And uh, after that, I uh, thanks to Will Robinson, who was uh, uh, just an uh, icon in sports in Detroit, uh -huh. he made it possible for me to, uh, to go to Vero Beach, Florida to try out with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Okay. And uh, the trial was successful. I was signed and then sent to Olean, New York to play in the Pony League. Okay, okay. And, uh, and uh, as a result, I, I met Jackie Robinson uh -huh. uh, in my travels. Uh, we were at the Vero Beach at the Dodger Town, and uh, the, the, he was uh, gracious enough to stay and talk to us about some of the problems we might face. Yeah. You know. Yeah, we never forget and, it for that. And, and so, you know, I, I think there are a lot of people, uh, including my nine-year-old son, uh, who have no real concept of the idea that baseball. There were two different leagues in in base, two entirely separate leagues in baseball, and that if you were African American, you played with other African Americans and not Absolutely. with uh, with white players. That's true. That yeah. uh, it, I think it was about eighteen, uh, about uh, uh, let's see, nineteen twenty. We organized the Negro League, right, and uh, it was uh, viable up until about 1960. Uh, uh -huh. and, and then when Jackie Robinson signed, naturally, uh, that and caused our league to fold. Sure. Yes, right. right, right. And so the Tigers, of course, this weekend are celebrating the Negro Leagues uh, at the ballpark. Tell me about some of the activities. Absolutely. Well, the weekend is really designed to pay tribute to the contributions of the former Negro Leagues players, as well as folks like Willie Horton, Gates Brown and the young folks who are coming up, Austin Jackson, Prince Fielder, and so the weekend in three segments can salute those who were the pioneers as well as those who took the, the gauntlet from the pioneers and then on to the gentlemen that we're seeing every day that are making us so proud. Right, and uh, we had a Negro League team here we did, the in Detroit, Detroit the Detroit Stars, and the, the Tigers usually on this weekend will wear the Stars uniform, right? That is correct. Yeah. Uh, the Tigers will wear the uniforms of the Detroit Stars, and the Braves will wear the uniforms of the Atlanta Black Crackers. So, you know, it's an opportunity for young people to come out and see you know, current players wearing the uniforms, the throwback uniforms, and I think that the, the, the brilliance and beauty of those throwback uniforms really pays tribute to just how amazing the Negro Leagues were and what that meant to the African American community. Yeah, yeah. Give us an idea of what it was like to, to play in, in this separate, segregated league. I mean, I, uh, history tends to, to sort of suggest that things got better when the, the leagues integrated, and I, I don't doubt that that's true, but I also uh, understand that there were some wonderful things about that league and uh, the players there. You're, you're absolutely right. I, I, I can recall when there was racial tension, whenever we uh, would uh, uh, arrive at a town, uh, people would be there to greet us and uh, treat us royally. And uh, it's just like a breath of fresh air. We, we, uh, and they just felt like we were the beacons of hope. Right. And uh, it's just, uh, just, just a wonderful, wonderful right. thing. And, and if you were an African-American child at that point, that was really all you could aspire to, uh, was playing in the Negro League. That's correct, too. And also, we proved that uh, we could play as well as the, the teams, the other, the ma other major leaguers. Right. Because we played games against them, right? And right. Uh, I would, we did not beat them all the time, but we held our own, right? And then uh, I think that uh, we showed that uh, we were, if given the opportunity, we could compete with, uh, with right. the other. Well, and you had a chance to, to to prove that, right? Too. Right? A absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I always uh, sort of say that that what one of the real tragedies of baseball history is that we don't know, for example whether Satchel Paige was the best uh, pitcher ever in history because he didn't face so many face of those, those other, and we don't know whether Babe Ruth, for example, was the best uh, hitter ever because he never had to face off against uh, African-Americans. 
that's true. Yeah. So uh, tell me more about what's uh, what the ballpark uh, celebration is going to be like this weekend. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, um, we'll have a singing competition so we can bring in some, you know, that fun, festive atmosphere. Um, we will also honor Larry Herndon. Former, uh, great former Detroit Outfielder Tigers from player. the 1984 uh, World Series. Team. And we will pay tribute to Larry. Um, we will give him the African American Legacy Award because, as I mentioned earlier, you have these wonderful gentlemen who played in the former Negro League, who played in the Negro Leagues, but there's also that segment of Detroit Tigers history where you have the Willie Hortons and Gates Browns and Larry Herndons. And so the African American Legacy Award was born out of the idea that we want people to keep celebrating these contributions. Right. Um, and then we will also uh, do something called the passing of the bat ceremony, where the bat will symbolize the passing of baseball through the African American generations. And so we'll start with a former Negro Leagues player and pass the bat down to a young man who is playing baseball currently in high school. Right. And so it's just a brilliant opportunity. And I think the Detroit Tigers for the past 11 years have had the weekend to incorporate all three phases of the history. But we, for 18 years have played this annual tribute game and it really is not just for African Americans but for the city of Detroit a great opportunity to celebrate baseball. Right, right. Uh, you mentioned some names there but we've got a, a, a very rich history uh, here in Detroit of, of African American players that have made a difference here. Uh, you know, Willie Horton was uh, on the team when I was a kid. I remember that as he was the first African American uh, player. I remember Ron Lafleur, uh, who who was one of my heroes when I was a, a kid playing baseball. And, and someone else I think we can never forget is Norman Turkey Stearns. Or Turkey Stearns, um, right? Hall of Famer, and uh, he actually has. A, there's actually a plaque in his honor on the side of Comerica Park because of the vast contributions that he made. Sure. I'd like to say that I had the opportunity to play. Uh, with Turkey Star. With Turkey Star. Oh, is that right? exhibition game in uh, Toledo, Ohio. And uh, he was approximately 50 years of age. Yeah. And, oh, really? And he was still playing. And, and we had a situation <laughs> in the game where he scored from first base on a, a single <laughs> at 50 years at of 50 age. 50 years of age. It was a hit and run play. <laughs> it, he was in motion. Sure. And the ball was hit between the fielders, and he scored. And he scored. Yeah. And I also <laughs> had a, an opportunity to be his roommate on a, a trip uh, down to uh, New Orleans. Yes, so it's very a nice. Very interesting person. Um, this is the 66th anniversary of uh, Jackie Robinson breaking that color barrier and joining uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers. Tell me about what it was like for the Negro League players once that happened. What changed uh, for you guys and what changed uh, for, for baseball generally? Well, I, I would like to say that, uh, speaking on behalf of the 6,000 or so. Uh, African Americans who play in the Negro League. We, we appreciate what the Tigers are doing. Mm -hmm. In so many instances, uh, teams are uh, beginning to uh, drop the idea of, of celebrating the, uh, the, uh, the Negro League. Is that right? So we really appreciate yeah. what the Tigers are doing. Also the fact that they are passing it down to the younger, uh, to, the, to the children, so that they would know uh, sure. about the Negro League. Right, yes. right. So, so now when, in, in 1957, when, uh, uh, Jackie Robinson uh, signs with the Brooklyn Dodgers. What? 40, 1947. I'm sorry, 47, not yes. 57. Uh, what what changes uh, uh, for the for the Negro Leagues? How quickly did did things really? Almost immediately. Yeah. Because I know when I was uh, uh, released by the Brooklyn Dodgers, I signed with the New York Cubans. Okay. And uh, you could see immediately that there was a lot of uh, chaos. Players were. Uh, joining the team and leaving the team and going to Canada to play and going different uh, directions and uh, the owners uh, were beginning to uh, lose money right and uh, almost immediately the, uh, the the league was going out of its exi existence right so, uh, but but you said it, it survived 13 more years until 1960 uh, about 1960 and yeah. 1962 but right. it was they were not uh, very making very much money so eventually right. they just faded. Right, uh, and you you did uh, get to as you said get to know Jackie Robinson for a brief time. For a brief time, uh, yes, I did. Yes, because you were also a part of the Dodgers organization. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that was very interesting too, because he talked to us about uh, how to uh, make it at, at, at Dodger Town, as I said before, just to know the follow the rules, right. be on time, right, be attentive, and if you possibly uh, if you do sign. 
try to get a bonus. Right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, well, they take that advice now. <laughs> right. right? <laughs> That's not a problem in the league. Um, what, what do you see as the future for African Americans in, in baseball? I know there's a, there's a real concern that uh, in a lot of uh, American cities, there's not a lot of opportunity for young kids to even play the game. Um, is that something that that? Uh, oh yeah, it's, it's quite a problem. I, I coached baseball at, at Northwestern High School for 20 years, mm -hmm. and uh, we it was baseball was in its heyday then. But gradually, you could see the decline, and, and the, the, the uh, youngsters are getting into football and, and uh, basketball. Sure. And uh, then they uh, also the basketball people started building portable. Nets, uh, right? You can <laughs> take be, anywhere, right? You can play anywhere, yeah. it, 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 and you would not need ten or twelve uh, other people to play with you. Just right. there's a net. You, you just, just play. Go, go, My right. son, you know, that's his sport. His, right. Absolutely. His basketball. He'll go watch baseball, but he's not playing. And if I right. could add, I think Major League Baseball is very aware. Recently, the commissioner yes. formed a diversity task force. That's right. Which is made up of representatives from ownership as well as former players to really address the issue, yeah. to address that talent pipeline, to make sure that we have in place have a future through, through of, RBI yeah. and the Urban Youth Academies to yeah. make sure that we're being responsible as a social organization, being socially responsible to create those opportunities for people to get engaged in the game. All right. Well, well, great to have you guys here. Great stuff going on at the ballpark this weekend. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to hear what you thought about today's program and get your ideas for future topics. So connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. We'll see you next time on American Black Journal. Lindsay wants to know. So I'm curious, what's DTE Energy doing to improve their customer service? Why don't we take a ride over there and let Rachel tell us. Hello. Hello. Take a walk with me. Here at DTE Energy, we're working very hard to improve our service, like answering every call under one minute and resolving the issue on the first call. Wow. No passing the buck, huh? Nope. And plus, we're adding over 100 customer service jobs right here in the state of Michigan. I need to get a real job. I'm going to send you an application. Thanks, Rachel. DTE Energy. Know your own power.